Hey, welcome, Alexis Chartrand, amazing fiddler and innovator. Thanks so much for joining me today. Thank you for having me. So you're in Montreal, mm -hmm. and I know you're going to play some music for us today. Do you want to start with a tune? Oh, yeah, I could. Um, yeah, I could play a little, um, a little uh, Quebecois jig you know, mm -hmm. from uh, the repertoire of uh, Joseph Allard. So. Uh, Joseph Allard was a fiddler uh, who was born in, in the end of the 19th century uh, and he lived until the mid uh, 20th century and uh, he was known as the, the Prince of Fiddlers and he also was the teacher of um, the first teacher of Jean Carignan mm -hmm. so uh, his musical legacy um, has been quite uh, important so for a little jig <laughs> Just gorgeous. I was just thinking about the fact that, of course, you're playing with a mic and you perform with a mic. But uh, often, yeah. Yeah. So back in the day, of course, people were playing in kitchens, but they would have, you know, big dances for the community and they'd have to kind of crank it out. So that it must have changed people's playing to be able to do more subtle things as they had amplification, do you think? Um, I think the, the question of amplification does have uh, a fair bit of, um, of impact on, on the playing. Mm -hmm. um, my playing is not always amplified and uh, I, I really um, I like uh, to be able to do both mm -hmm. and it's something that I really um, try to make a, a part of my practice not to leave you know either mm -hmm. um, um, out uh, of it. And so um, I do adapt my playing for, you know, whether I'm playing um, acoustically or in, in a bigger hall or in a smaller hall mm -hmm. or whether I'm playing um, with, a, with a microphone and a PA in a bigger space or in a smaller space. Um, and I think, you know, both setups are, um, are interesting for different reasons. Um, and I like to, to, to be uh, sensitive and mindful of that fact. Um, regarding playing, uh, the, the playing of uh, older Quebecois fiddlers, uh, they, they didn't necessarily have access to amplification, especially in the earlier part of uh, the 20th century, but um, it became something quite normal, um, you know, pretty, you know, early during the re revival, uh, as some of these fiddlers, um, you know, were, were starting to to be showcased in, in events, mm -hmm. you know, um, in festivals, in uh, different settings. And um, I mean, if we're talking about dance music, then often the, the communities that gathered to dance, um, it wasn't hundreds of people, mm -hmm. you know. And so it was possible for, you know, a fiddler or a small ensemble to, you know, drive the to dance forward with uh, with acoustic instruments, you know, and that's how it was it was really done in, in those communities for um, for you know many decades. So let's talk about dance. It's a big part of your life. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I, I I grew up in a family of dancers. My mm -hmm. my mom Anne Marie Gardet is um, a specialist of Baroque dance. She participated in uh, the recreation of uh, those dances in France. Uh, in the the eighties, um, notably with Rizé Danserie, Francine Lancelot, 
so people who did some research in you know how to find ways to to recreate what was basically the the direct ancestor of uh, ballet mm-hmm. and uh, and my dad Pierre Chartrand uh, is a step dancer a Quebecois step dancer a caller so someone who um, does a kind of uh, have speaking half uh, singing to explain the dance mm-hmm. you know and that's a, an american tradition that arrived in in quebec in the 20s or 30s um and uh, they both also are dance researchers so they they've done some historical um research and ethnological research on baroque dance on the dance that was danced in uh, nouvelle france so in the mm-hmm. early uh, french colony on the what is now uh, the Quebec and maritime territories, um, and uh, my dad also um, has no, done a lot of ethnological studies on the social and uh, solo dancing in uh, mostly in Quebec, but also in the Maritimes and a little bit in Ontario. So would that be a tradition that was carried down just by showing people? Because with Baroque, I know things were actually written down, right? There's like. Uh, yeah, written the, descriptions. Uh, Baroque dance has, uh, in, in France, uh, there's the notation Beauchamp Feuillet. Mm-hmm. Um, so there are scores for those dances. Um, and uh, my mom learned to decipher those things and she can uh, recreate choreographies that were notated that way. Um, so that's a big part of, of the work of you know, Baroque, uh, contemporary Baroque dancers. For what uh, for the um, traditional dance, um, it's based more on collecting. You know, mm-hmm. uh, there are some written sources because people have been taking note of um, what was danced during uh, dance evenings or uh, during social events for a very long time. But um, the practice, the actual movements of of the step dancing, the actual movement of the social dancing, the quadrille, the square dances, the tillon, the contredance. Um, we, we had living sources of these things. Mm-hmm. And, um, you know, people like um, Simone Voyer or Normand Legault were pioneers uh, in, uh, in Quebec of going and meeting those people who still knew those dances and uh, filming, learning those dances, and transmitting that, uh, that knowledge and that practice to uh, the, the new generation. So often when you play, you use your feet as percussion. Mm-hmm. I think in English, do we call that clogging? Uh, clogging is uh, more of a, of a word that we use in England, mm-hmm. and it references English step dancing. Okay. So in... Um, so the, the what we call like foot tapping or foot percussion, percussion mm-hmm. is quite specific to uh, francophone uh, traditional music in mostly in eastern Canada, so Quebec, mm-hmm. a little bit of Ontario, and in the Maritimes. Um, in in Prince Edward Island, they even call it um, la gigasies. So they they have some uh, um, some little choreographies that they can do um, while sitting down. Um, its uh, its origins are unclear. There's not a lot of uh, very specific research. Uh, the earliest written sources of it, I think, are from the early 20th century. Uh, but it really it's something that really most fiddlers um, from you know just before the, the the first half of the 20th century, I think, were doing in Quebec. Uh, so the 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 Québécois fiddlers, like uh, you know, the ones we we all uh, we all know now, it's like Carignan foot tapped and uh, Louis Boudreau foot tapped and André Alain. So all of these people were self accompanying with their feet, um, and it it became um, it really it it become a, a staple of uh, like an, ad- an identifying staple of Québécois traditional music, mm-hmm. and it's become uh, deeply associated with. Um, the image uh, of Quebecois traditional music, both locally and internationally. Um, and it's something that, you know, almost every fiddler I know at least uh, has learned how to do. And uh, whether they, they do it on stage or often um, depends on their, their preferences. So 
you have an incredible groove in your playing and flexibility. When you were learning to do the foot percussion with playing, was it hard to coordinate when you were a kid? Um, I think if we're talking about groove, um, in, in, in my mind, it, it has more to do with dance than it has to do with foot tapping. Mm -hmm. um, the, the interesting thing about a, a, like, um, um, a practice of music that it has very deep connections with another practice like dance, you know, mm -hmm. it could be something else, but in that case it's dance, is that it, it really reframes the way we think of what our priorities are. You know, and for me growing up, um, so I was studying, you know, classical music uh, here in Montreal, but I was also accompanying, you know, my dad, uh, my dad's step dancing classes and sometimes um, social, you know, mm -hmm. dancing. And something I quickly realized was that the utmost priority of my playing needed to be like, will it drive and inspire the dancers? Mm -hmm. Is that, are they going to have fun? You know, are they going to want to dance? Are they going to enjoy that? You know, and without even going into the technical uh, necessities um, of that goal, you get a pretty strong and immediate feeling of whether you're doing uh, good or not. Mm -hmm. you know? And then um, especially contrasting that with a more academic um, learning experience in classical music, it's a very, very interesting and to my to my um, uh, mind, healthy way of reframing what we need to think and to think about and prioritize when we're playing, mm -hmm. and so um, and then once we've you know understood that the, that was the goal, um, I mean then we can start learning. You know I, I learned a lot from step dancers, l listening to the sound of of uh, their feet to the, the inherent groove that they've developed, um, to me, that's really the, the basis of um, my practice of, of uh, the bow, you know, all of the, the rhythms that we have mm -hmm. to, to um, summon with the, the traditional uh, style of, of bowing, um, personally is deeply, deeply related to uh, the practice of step dancing in Quebec. Mm -hmm. So in the description of this conversation, there'll be links to your, your albums and lots of things so people can hear the, the footwork. But I, I don't think, are you set up now with a board? Could you? Uh, um, no, not right yeah, now. Yeah, yeah, I didn't no. figure. No. Um, but you do have another instrument by your side. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, um, I took out the a Baroque violin that uh, is being lent to me by uh, a very uh, nice uh, friend and, and colleague, Alex Keeler. Uh, from the Eastern uh, Townships, and that's uh, that's been part of my practice for uh, a few years now. Um, I've been um, exploring the idea of um, um, adapting traditional uh, Quebecois music for uh, a historical instrument. Mm -hmm. um, it's something that hasn't been done a lot in Quebec. I know of some uh, musicians. Uh, in Quebec City, that Baroque mm -hmm. musicians who played a little bit of uh, Quebecois music. There's some uh, Baroque violinists in Montreal that have done a little bit of that. And obviously, if we look outside of Quebec, uh, people like uh, David Greenberg have mm -hmm. done an amazing, an am really amazingly inspiring work on the uh, the connections and, mm -hmm. and you know between um, Baroque violin and uh, fiddling. Um, but not a lot of it has been done specifically with the uh, Quebecois repertoire. Mm -hmm. And so I've, uh, um, I've been very interested in, uh, in trying to make that happen, uh, while keeping in mind that it is, you know, intrinsically anachronistic. Um, because the sources we have for Quebecois fiddling are way too recent for them to have uh, been linked with historical instruments, you know, and the the, the style of playing of Quebecois fiddlers, um, they're they're deeply um, indebted to you know the the modern violin, the modern construction of the of the violin, but especially the modern construction of of the bow, yeah. and obviously, um, I mean, people who are familiar with uh, you know the way bows are made will recognize some of the characteristics of a modern bow with its uh, quite long length 
you know, <laughs> it's pretty intricate um, frog here. Um, the, it has uh, some uh, garnishes and it has a screw that allows for, you know, making the, um, the hair more or less uh, tense. Um, which, which are all things that um, I do not have on the Baroque bow I use. You know, it's a very primitive uh, style of bow. It's much shorter. You know, it fits on the whole screen right now. Uh, it has no, um, it has pretty much nothing on the frog. It doesn't have a screw. Uh, it's a little piece of wood that just clips in mm -hmm. place. And I use a little piece of, um, um, I think this is um, leather uh, to decide how much tension I use, and uh, it's it's bent uh, differently, so it <laughs> reacts deeply differently, and that's been uh, I think a big part of of my work on the instrument has been trying to find ways to adapt uh, techniques that um, you know have been developed on the modern bow and try to adapt them to uh, uh, an instrument that is anachronistic. And then the, the, the other part of it has been um, just, you know, taking advantage of the gut strings. Mm -hmm. So, uh, which have a, a very, very um, nice, rich, dark uh, tone that I personally find very, very appealing. Um, but uh, that is maybe less um, evidently usable in the context of uh, Quebecois traditional music, which is often, you know, very driven, very um, um, powerful and very um, uh, intense. You've done some interesting collaborations where you've played Baroque violin with modern at the same time mm -hmm. for that timbre. So, but you, then you're tuning to our standard modern tuning. So uh, I, it's interesting that you mentioned that because I'm currently working uh, on this, uh, on these ideas with my colleague and friend Nicolas Babineau. Mm -hmm. um, we've already um, we've been working together for almost five years now, and uh, we released already two albums, uh, one in 2017, one in 2019, uh, both of which I only played modern violin on. Uh, but last year, um, you know. Throughout my research and my work on the, the Baroque instrument, um, and I was talking about it with, with Nico, and we, we kind of realized that we were both very excited to try to bring that, those, the possibilities of that instrument into the music of our duo. And so we started doing that, and we're currently working on a project um, to, to create a concert that will be presented uh, in a few uh, festivals this summer at Memoire Racine in Joliet uh, in late uh, August, uh, no, late July, and in late August in Beaumont for um, Esprit de Souche, in, um, organized by Marie Music. I will also be at uh, Concert des Îles du Bic uh, mm -hmm. for a conference and discussion around that, uh, that subject of playing traditional music on the uh, Baroque instrument. And um, uh, indeed, we, we, we are doing a lot of work in trying to bring together Nicolas' modern uh, violin and my playing of the Baroque instrument. And it's, uh, it's kind of brought up a lot of very interesting questions of um, how to bring together those, you know, those two worlds that seem um, sometimes a little bit incompatible. Um, and what's happened is, uh, I mean, you were mentioning tuning, and uh, so I tune uh, the, the Baroque violin a whole step down, you know. So, you know, historically it would have been um, a, a, an early French uh, tuning, so at mm -hmm. A392 instead of A440. Ah, okay. You know, for me it's very uh, useful because it's exactly um, a whole tone lower than the modern uh, instruments. So when I've worked with Lévy Bourbonnet on harmonica, um, I was just, I was playing, we, we could play together uh, and it would work um, perfectly. So we do some of that with Nico, but Nico is also using uh, a lot of uh, cross tuning on his violin. And uh, so what ends up happening is that 
his modern violin is not tuned at all uh, in a standard way, mm -hmm. you know. And the the uh, Baroque violin uh, is tuned usually in a standard way. Some there's a little bit of cross tuning, but less so. Uh, I find it less comfortable to retune the gut strings. They're a little more uh, sensitive than the the modern yeah. nylon uh, strings. But um, yeah, a big part of the show right now. So my 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 uh, Baroque violin is tuned. Um, so from top to bottom, it would be D G C F. Mm -hmm. You know, and Nicholas fiddle from top to bottom would be F A D F, mm -hmm. so a kind of open D minor. Mm -hmm. Um, and he's been figuring out how to use that uh, that tuning, and he switches a little bit sometimes. Uh, he plays an E A D E mm -hmm. too, and sometimes I tune up the low string, uh, the, the, the low F string up to a G to get a um. A traditional tuning that we call grondeuse in Quebec. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I played Baroque violin for quite a few years, as mostly chamber music, and um, Bieber wrote quite a few scordatura with really cool tunings. That'd be yeah, to try. <laughs> yeah, I mean, cross tuning is is a very important part of uh, most uh, fiddle traditions, mm -hmm. you know, across North America. Um, old time fiddlers cross tuned a lot. Uh, Acadian fiddlers. Uh, Quebecois fiddlers, Métis fiddlers from the prairies. Um, it's uh, it's it's really a, a great um, a great way to explore, you know, a slightly different um, um, feeling on the instrument and mm -hmm. explore um, uh, different possibilities. It creates often like interesting resonances. Mm -hmm. um, it it uh, it allows for different harmonic ideas. In Quebec, there's um, a lot of uh, very active fiddlers who love cross-tuning to accompany songs. So people like Lisa Arnstein or Pascal Jem, um, they they love to to try you know very uh, very experimental tunings that allow them to play um, you know chords that will um, accompany beautifully traditional singing. Mm -hmm. um, so it's a it's a very very interesting tool and a very useful one. So can we hear a bit of your broke violin? Can you play a tune? Sure. Let's see. I think um, I think I'll play a little reel um, called the Reel des Grands Pieds. It's a tune that um, I've played for many years on the uh, modern violin and uh, it can be heard at the very beginning of the uh, the first album with uh, Nicola, um, but and I and I find it interesting to hear the the very huge difference in timbre that we get with the gut strings and that the possibilities that this bow uh, gives us with it. Um, so here, the Rille des Grands Pieds. Thank you. 
Oh, so beautiful. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Um, so there's so much ornamentation in both hands, it strikes me. And of course, in Baroque times, people were really gifted at uh, improvisation and just uh, all kinds of ornaments. So there's there's that parallel. Um, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, indeed. Um, I mean, ornamentation is, is a very, very important part of b both Baroque uh, uh, violin playing and uh, contemporary fiddling. Yeah. So um, are there names for all the different, you know, like all the different bow things when you teach it? So the thing with, with naming and kind of categorizing um, and classifying uh, playing is that it, it is not a it is not a worry of everyone mm -hmm. um, and um, it is it is often you know a requirement in academic types of music you know people who who want to create um, you know uh, in a syllabus maybe or a program or um, maybe a um, you know a handbook of ornamentation or of, you know fiddle playing or something uh, they have an incentive to name and describe and categorize things um, some fiddlers love to do that some uh, don't really care for it indeed in my teaching I often have to you know decide on um, on a name for things so that uh, maybe I can reference it to my, my students. Um, and um, I'd say that, I mean, in traditional music, there is no overarching authority. And so everyone kind of comes up with their own, you know, names for things, or maybe just with uh, whatever name they heard someone else uh, mention. Mm -hmm. So there's no... There's not a uh, there's a lot of variety in what people what what words people are going to use, uh, but if we listen to the actual techniques and if we pay attention to what people are actually playing, then we see a lot of commonalities. And um, you know there are ornaments specific you know to Ireland to Scotland uh, to old time music to Acadian music to Quebecois music to Ontarian music mm -hmm. to Métis music. Um, and um, personally, I've mostly been studying and learning uh, Quebecois ornamentation and Irish ornamentation. Mm -hmm. That's a, you know, my my where my personal preferences went to. Um, but Scottish ornamentation is very very rich. Uh, Cape Breton ornamentation mm -hmm. is very very interesting. Um, and uh, you know, there's really like a wealth of of knowledge and uh, and ideas that. We find we can find just by listening to what other people do, and uh, you know, stealing uh, an ornament after another, and sometimes coming up with um, our own personal ways of of using uh, those ornaments. But if if there's one thing that I find very important to to remember regarding ornamentation is that, um, especially in certain forms of academic music, we tend to see ornamentation as the seasoning that gets you know sprinkled on top mm. of of a melody and what we realize when we dive deep into uh, traditional music and i think it's probably true of, of baroque music i don't i'm not an expert in there but um what we realize is that ornamentation is structuring uh it it, it structures the phrasing it structures the bowing it, it you cannot uh, actually take it away you know mm -hmm. you, you cannot take it out of the music if you do you get something that um, uh, to to most ears will sound compromised in a way or another but what's interesting is that you need ornamentation but you don't need any specific ornamentation you know mm -hmm. some some fiddlers will never learn some of the ornaments that every other fiddlers uh, know how to do mm -hmm. and uh, some fiddlers will have you know, a few very specific ornaments they do very well and stick to those ones. And some fiddlers will be going around learning every ornament they can um, mm. they can find. Uh, and so and so, it's not really necessarily about learning the right ornaments as much as it being an integral part of the phrasing and of the practice of that music. Mm -hmm. And so I I often you know warn uh, my students about uh, you know leaving it for the end. You know, 
leaving it for later. Um, I think it's important to to take it into account as soon as we start um, getting interested in a tune or, or in a whole style of, of uh, traditional playing. Mm -hmm. And when you tour, I imagine you must collect tunes a little bit? Different. Oh, that's a good question. Um, I've never... I've never felt like I was someone who learned a lot of tunes. I tend to, I know I tend to fall in love with tunes and carry them for years and years, mm -hmm. uh, and really, um, you know, squeeze as much music as I can out of them. Um, which is why, you know, currently with Nicola, we are working only on repertoire that we've already recorded, uh, but we've changed the, the mm -hmm. instrumentation, we've changed the arrangements. Um, uh, you know, we find tunes uh, in all sorts of places, but there's no bad place. So sometimes it's, you know, tunes we've heard on, on a CD, mm -hmm. uh, tunes we've heard online, tunes we've heard um, on a documentary, um, tunes we've heard in person, you know, someone recording it for us, or uh, tunes we've sought out. Mm -hmm. We've heard someone play something and we've been like, where can I find that? Can you record it for me? Um, I tend to to believe that it's not the, the it's not the most important thing is not necessarily where a tune is found. It's really what we do with it uh, afterwards. Mm -hmm. And um, and what I like um, about uh, traditional music is is specifically that you know an oral tradition depends largely on people you know, passing down melodies, you know, and very often without any recorded or uh, written medium, which means that the, the tune needs to have stayed alive in their head for at least long enough for someone else to be able to, um, to, to learn it. And so for me, there's something very um, interesting in the idea that, you know, when, when we get access to that repertoire, we we know that it, it's been interesting enough to someone and uh, probably to a few people to be carried through, you know, uh, a few fiddlers and a few generations. Um, and, you know, when then we fall in love with that tune, you know, um, for whatever reason and wherever we found it, um, that's, you know, that's enough for me to, to want to play it and to mm. want to to want to perform it and share it with other people. Um, I have a, a question about your training as a classical violinist, because you did quite a bit of that, I'm sure, when you are a teen. You went to an arts high school. Yeah, so I started um, I started learning violin in uh, private lessons with a, a violinist in Montreal named uh, Diane Plant, mm -hmm. uh, who also played uh, Baroque violin, even though I never studied that with her. But mm -hmm. it was always, you know, around. I, I knew about those things from a very early age. I started around the age of seven, I think. Mm -hmm. um, and um, so I did, what, five, six years of that. And then I went to uh, Joseph-François Perrault. So it's a high school, a music high school in the Quartier Saint-Michel in Montreal. A public school that, you know, built uh, its, um, its music program from the ground up from, I think, the 70s or 80s. And it's now, I think, one of the biggest music programs uh, in high school in, in Canada. And um, and there, I mean, I played, you know, in in string ensembles. I played in symphony orchestras, and I sang in the choir. But mostly, I really, really discovered. I just discovered and fell in love uh, with a lot of classical and romantic music. Mm -hmm. um, and that was really um, uh, for me. Uh, I mean. We listen to a little bit of classical music, you know, some uh, Bach partitas, and uh, you know, um, at home. But uh, I didn't know about, um, you know, all the the a lot of the yeah late classical and uh, and romantic music, and mm -hmm. discovering Beethoven, discovering um, Mahler, discovering a lot of uh, you know Honegger, like a lot of amazing composers, was uh, became like a really 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 um, important part of, um, of the music I wanted to listen to and to engage with. And after that, I went uh, to Saint Laurent de Cégep in Montreal. And I, I ended up, uh, I was quite lucky to end up in 
a composition program there. Mm -hmm. um, and I uh, discovered uh, contemporary music and electroacoustic music under the tutelage of an amazing, amazing man called uh, Michel Tetro, uh, who's been teaching um, composition almost single-handedly <laughs> in that program for a few decades now. Uh, yeah, and um, you know, in Cégep I didn't play uh, violin uh, anymore. So uh, basically, you know, I, I did 10 years of, uh, mm. of classical violin uh, I did traditional music throughout, but on my own and with the people I knew because of, of my upbringing. Um, but I'd say that, you know, discovering the music was as, I, it was more uh, important to me actually in hindsight than um, uh, necessarily performing it, mm -hmm. I think. Um, because I think the, the, the choral repertoire that I sang even though I didn't sing it very well, uh, had a, a tremendous impact on, on my music making. And, um, and so, uh, yeah, that was a, a very, very important part of, uh, of learning music for me. Mm -hmm. So um, I thank you so much for coming today. And I'm just wondering if you could leave us with a ballad. Yeah, well, that's, a, that's an interesting thing. Um, I've been, that's something I've been working on for I think probably 10 years now, um, you know, the traditional music in Quebec is often associated with high energy mm -hmm. dance music. And um, I was, uh, you know, at the end of, um, uh, of my teenage years, I was longing for some, uh, some slower, slower paced music. And part of it was just taking maybe dance tunes and slowing them down a little bit mm -hmm. and changing their mood. But uh, something I also started doing was uh, playing song melodies mm -hmm. on the violin, which is something that is very, very common in Ireland, for example. Uh, but it's not done a lot in Quebec. It, it, it does exist. I didn't invent that. But um, it's not part of the common practice of fiddlers um, right now. And that's something I've been always, uh, I mean, I've been very in inter interested in uh, for yeah, the past 10 years and um, and it happened to really really co like coincide well with my interest in the Baroque uh, violin because the the kind of phrasing we can do with the Baroque bow mm -hmm. uh, the kind of tone we can get from the gut string uh, lent itself so so nicely and naturally to uh, some of these uh, these slow songs that I've been uh, carrying for uh, for a few years now, so um, yeah, I could uh, I could play a little um, a little complaint. Uh, so a traditional melody that uh, I've stripped of its words, um, but I feel like there are um, there there's a, an interesting depth and um, you know subtlety in in the in how much singers could put in those melodies that could seem oversimplistic to certain people at first glance um, and um, you know and I think that maybe some of the the narration the narrative uh, component of of these song melodies gets distilled in uh, in the notes that are left when you take the words uh, away so uh, yeah
Thank you so much, Alexi. Thank you for having me.